good intro music. Welcome to Completely Serious, a podcast uh, with Public House Media. I'm the host, Ryan Pierce, with me. Uh, the more important name of us two in this particular episode, the one you want to hear speak, is Jeffrey Clark, copy editor and page designer for Shaw Media in the burbs of Chicago. Am I right? It's up in the Chicago area? Yeah, okay. well, I'm a copy editor and page designer. I'm not the only person who does it. That'd be way too much work for one man to mm. handle. So modest. Just doing so, a bunch of newspapers. You design pages. So you design the font. You design the size. You cut off the wood from the tree and turn it into paper. How do you design a page? Well, for example, you know, I just got off of work recording this late at night, by the way. Um I did the DeKalb Daily Chronicle sports section tonight, and there was one local story um, on the front page. It was actually a column tonight about the future of college football broadcasting, about how some conferences like the MWC and Mac Knights were only content one day. So I was talking about that. I had a couple page, I had a couple page, I had a page and a half of Bears talking, and I had a page of Agate. And at, least, at least they played it close. So at least the game was exciting. You know, you, it's always unfortunate when uh, the U.S. gets blown out by uh, another soccer team while we try to grow our fan base. But that sounds like a lot of work. You do a great job. I'm sure there's a light humming sound. It's your computer working hard. Just wanted to note that in case anybody uh, could hear that in the background. It is kind of uh, methodical. It's kind of nurturing. I will say, well, I'm not sure when this podcast will go out. It'll likely be over the weekend is when they're going to be hearing this. So a lot of the stuff you just said will be outdated, but it's good to hear the background of a page designer and copy editor. That's quite the position. So yeah, that I sounds exciting. I should point out, by the way, that um – you know, I, at one time I was doing an interview like a, a month and a half ago. My computer went into thermal shutdown. It goes off by itself, and then you turn it back on. We're three minutes in. We're already talking about thermal shutdowns. Let's talk about sports. This okay. is the podcast where we talk about sports and have fun. I think that's my my tagline. I like that. It's unofficial, but I, I like that that thought. Uh, we talk about I you sports. Said we were to talk about whatever the hell we wanted. That's later on. That is after the microphone turns off. And maybe when we play a little game of Would You Rather later on. We'll, right. we'll get there in a little bit. First, I want to talk basketball. You're a basketball fan, Jeffrey Clark. Am I right? Yes, I am. You I like am basketball. Part of, I write for a, a blog called Chicago Bulls Confidential. In fact, I just wrote a story today about how the Bulls are switching up their uniforms for the year and that they'll be wearing red at home from now on and white on the road. What do you like about basketball? Is it the, the shape of the ball? Is it the rectangular form of the court? Is it the lines? What do you like about basketball? Well, as much as a geometrical shape would be a tempting reason and the outline of the court, um, I'm going to have to say that you know Michael Jordan is the one who got me into basketball and his Chicago Bulls back in the 90s. I want to ask you, I want to ask you a question, being the expert that you are. Um, yes. Why is a basketball hoop called a hoop and not a basket? Isn't basketball, shouldn't, shouldn't the, the actual thing the game is named after be called a basket? Wait. You know, it's very, very interesting because you know, if you know anything about the history of basketball, and I assume you do because you brought this up, um, the very first basketball game was played with peach jackets and soccer balls. And Iceland basketball was scored in the very first game. Why did it get stuck in the basket? They did not think because to have a hole in it? Out of it. Did they not think one person would make a basket? I'm not sure what their thought process was there. Well, well it was a whole a whole. If there was one, it was not big enough to um... – I think it's important to to look at how much basketball has been on TV this month. We are now in the early uh, minutes of August. Not, we're not in the throngs of August yet. We're not uh, weeks into the month. We are in the early forms, the, the birthing moments of August. And reflecting back on July – I would say I watched at least 80 or 90 basketball games between Did summer you know? between summer league, that Allen Iverson three on three league with Ice Cube. Um, I, I probably watched the WNBA, uh, WNBA for that matter. I probably watched a good uh, a good 80 basketball games at least at least at one point or another. I want I'm going to start saying some numbers and I want you to tell me when you when to stop when I've accurately uh, described how much basketball in terms of minutes you watched. Are you ready? Okay. I'm going to start off with 6,000. This is over July? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, about, you probably want to save your breath here because – I'll, I'll, I'll give you – give me give me a yes or no. Uh, 5,000. 
no. Four thousand. No. Three thousand. Let me just see the trouble right now and say that two thousand. Much a, a good portion of one Bulls okay. summer league game, and because you know I've I've been busy a lot, you know, between my work life and my social life and my relationship, so. You know, it's kind of tough to find time to watch basketball these days. I haven't had a chance to watch the uh, three-on-three tournament yet, but the fact that they get so many big names from the recent NBA past is a very a very interesting thing. I think Ice Cube had a nice inkling of what this league was going to be when he decided. But what I want to know is, you know, that they have this thing on TV called the basketball tournament. It's just called the basketball tournament. And they have all these teams that nobody's ever heard of. Have you had a chance to watch any of that? I did. I, I've watched a little bit, went to a couple games in my hometown. And uh, a lot of it, it's former college players. They've come back and they're playing for uh, an alumni team of sorts from their, their basketball uh, college days. They have teammates from different eras on uh, from that college on their team. And they're playing in a summer competition. And you bring up another one, though. The, the, the basketball tournament, you have... Uh, the Allen Iverson League, the three-on-three tournament, the WNBA, the Summer League. There's so many outlets for basketball in the month of July, almost more than any other time of the year. You can argue with free agency in the NBA draft, I guess, in the end of June, that we're in one of the busiest times for basketball the entire year. When we're in mid-July, I think it reflects just uh, how smart the NBA is and how well they have been able to infiltrate our brains with basketball when it's 98 degrees outside. And they do such a good job putting their product in front of us. What do you think? What says ye? Well, the, the other thing that I really want to bring up, you know, you brought all those one, uh, wonderful things with basketball, but the one thing that you neglected to mention was the NBA Africa game. That goes oh, on. of course. Yeah. With the, with the Kame Matambo, I think Lol Deng has taken part in it in the past before. And they only do it once a year, right? but they always go over there during the summer. You know, you got current and former players who are playing on an, an exhibition of sorts for the people of that continent. And, you know, you've been to Africa uh, several times before. Indeed. And, uh, you know, let me just ask you, as somebody who has been to Africa and experienced young minds in Africa, uh, did they ever talk about basketball over there, particularly international stars? They do play a little basketball over there. I think it could be more popular. I think, again, you, you brought up a good point. Uh, this big game in, in Africa is just part of the NBA's uh, branding and is part of their outreach throughout the world. You know, while other sports, say football, maybe baseball even, are, for that matter, the NHL, are confined to the boundaries of the United States. The NBA is over in Africa having an exhibition game. There, they send Kevin Durant to India to hold a 3,000-player basketball camp. That's right, they did. They are doing such an incredible job of putting their product in different parts of the world. And I think maybe it's because of the 1992 Dream Team. They saw what that led to, the talent that came out of Europe in the, the coming decades. And they thought, hey, why not do this? With Africa, why not do this with India? We, we're already doing it in China um, with Sifan Marbury. He's got a statue of himself. And I think the, a, the genius of the NBA to take this dull time of the year, July may be the weakest month for sports, use it to improve their brand, use it to put their product in front of you, whether it be in the form of a three-on-three tournament with ex-washed-out players or old college players in the, the basketball uh, tournament or the WNBA, they do a great job putting their product in front of people wherever they may be. Well, let's not just you know say that the NBA has been doing this. I mean, college teams, particularly you know top tier college teams, have been you know going overseas and playing in tournaments for several times now. And you know it's also it's not just the summer with the NBA. You probably remember several times in the past that. You know, the best NBA teams get to go over to Europe and play in the McDonald's Championship. I want to talk about baseball because it is August. It is the month for baseball. Football has not yet taken did over its baseball? sports throne. Oh, oh, yes, I did mention baseball. So you I'm mentioned sorry. baseball. I want to talk about baseball. Okay. Baseball is – we've entered the playoff hunt. We've entered – the throngs of the baseball season. You're a Chicago guy. You know, you don't put ketchup on your hot dog. You are oozing with Midwestern charm. You mm -hmm. still put pajamas on your life-size statue of Michael Jordan. 
In Chicago, you have the Cubs and the White Sox. The Cubs expertly defending their title with a modest division lead. The White Sox are tanking perfectly. Two different directions. I want you to look at baseball and think to me who right now is having the best season as a competitor and as a tanker. I feel like the tanker might be obvious here. I think I know where you're going to go with it. Who Who's the team to beat in baseball, though? Who's the team to beat and who is setting themselves up for uh, the future the best. I'll, I'll give my answers while you think. I think the team that is setting themselves up uh, for the future, the you know what, I'll go with, uh, go ahead and give me your answer. I'm going to I'm gonna keep the listener's attention by maybe teasing mine and, and giving it in a bit. Okay, well, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious that the White Sox are doing the best tanking job, if that's what you want to call it, because it, just about every move that they've made has caught the attention of people who are working in baseball, people who are not working in baseball, because they acquire all these top-tier prospects from uh, these organizations. One of them is Uprights Now, uh, Yohan Mankata, and a couple of pitching prospects might be coming up pretty soon as the rosters expand to September uh, to up to 40 players. Um, you know, they have guys who are making a lot of noise. Some people are saying that Yohan know, Mankata has been passed in the ranks uh, by Eloy Jimenez, whom they acquired from the Cubs for uh, Jose Quintana. But I'd say that the team that is best set up to win right now is the Houston Astros. And I'm telling you this because they had guys who matured you know, quicker than anyone expected. And they have an insurmountable division lead. I think that the Astros have the talents to finally succeed because... You know, they, they've been to the playoffs before, but you know, I think the young talent is coming along at the right time. A lot of people are saying the Dodgers are fantastic with the pitching staff and with the young talent they've had. Cody Bellinger, Justin Turner, Yasiel Pui sometimes. But I feel like that until the Dodgers can prove otherwise that – and because they are perennial playoff chokers. I'm, I'm going to st- go with you. I'm going to agree with the, the White Sox. It's tough to disagree the way they've tanked. They've expertly played horrible – but they've gotten some young prospects, and they're building for the future. Um, I'm going to flip it. I'm going to uh, give you a team that you mentioned as my team to beat in baseball. That would be, I think it's the Dodgers. You know, you look at this pitching staff now with you, Darvish. You've got Kershaw, who's on a roll. They're, they're deep. I'm not sure what Bellinger is taking. I'm not sure what happened between the minor leagues where he was, I believe, what, a, a 13th round pick. Then he comes through the system, and he's not really a home run hitter, and now he comes through the majors, and he's bashing balls out at a quicker rate than anybody else in the, the big leagues. you got Seager. You've got Bellinger. you still got Gonzalez. You've got a, a combination of veteran leadership and young talent. The Dodgers are so well put together for a deep run. I To me, they're still the team to beat. I like the Astros. I think they're one year away. They're young. They have guys, as you mentioned, developing quickly. I like the, the Dodgers, though, in the postseason. I think the Cubs are going to put up a fight. The Nationals got a great lineup. They have Scherzer leading the way as their ace. But I think the Dodgers right now are the team to beat. What a fun series that would be, Houston versus L.A. Okay, I want to play a game real quick. We're going to play a little game called Would You Rather. It's really a thought-provoking, and it really kind of says something about you as a person. All right, would you rather – we're going to start this one off. We're going to start this one off, and I agree. Would you rather have you, Darvish, or Sonny Gray? To me, it's obvious. I go with the young gun, the controllable contract, the guy with the ceiling – and the player that hasn't had the injury issues, and he came up in the Oakland A system in Sunny Gray. I think his upside's better. I like the pickup for the Yankees. I think Milwaukee gave it a shot. They obviously didn't have the pieces. I think Sunny Gray is not only going to be a, a, a borderline ace for New York over this year, he's going to be a great pitcher for them for years to come. I'm going to disagree. I'm going to say that you, Darvish, the guy I would rather have. That this is a guy who has a little bit of a stronger track record and he's a guy who can put a rotation like the Dodgers over the top. If you're a contender this late into the season and you can get somebody who has experience, that has some very good stuff and has been able to hold opponents at bay for a good period of time, then I have to say that the Dodgers 
and you, Darvish, they kind of lucked out because they have somebody near the top of their rotation who does a whole lot. And, you know, I think everybody is going to be happy with this acquisition a little more than a sunny great one. I'm going to give you the magic wand, and you can touch a team, and you become the owner of this team for the rest of the year. You have two options. Would you rather be a team like the Royals, streaking, but your battle to get to the playoffs is still a bit uphill? They have work to do. Or the Diamondbacks, who are coming back to earth a little bit. But it still looks like they have a strong hold on that uh, wild card lead. I think they're up by five games against the next closest opponent, which might be the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, so even though they're struggling a bit, they look like they'll make the playoffs. Would you rather be a team like the Royals? You're hot, but you may not make it. Or would you rather be the Diamondbacks? You're having a hard time, but you're pretty much a lock. It's, it's very, very difficult to say for sure, but I think I'd rather go with a team that's struggling and, but is a lock because we have had teams in the past, I've followed teams in the past that have had better that have really hot streaks but ended up fizzling out at the end. I'll give you a perfect example. Back in 2010, the White Sox got a really hot streak towards the end of the All-Star break and ended up not making it. But, you know, if you know that you're going to the playoffs, I mean, isn't that what it's all about? You're trying to get to the World Series, trying to win the World Series. I mean, if something's not... That is the goal. I think most teams, they have that etched on their motivational posters at the beginning of the year. They, The goal is, I believe to win the World Series. So, yes, I agree. Get to the playoffs and win the whole thing. I mean, any, any team can go on a hot streak, but not every team can get into the playoffs. So, so you're of the mindset, you're of the philosophical stance that get in and then win. That is the key. You just got to get in and yep. see what happens. Yep, that's what happens. I mean, look at the Cubs just two years ago. They were the second wild card team, and they went on a big run. We're looking even further back, the 2007 Rockies. They won a whole bunch of games, and they got to the playoffs, and they ended up going to the World Series. So, you know, it's all about getting hot at the right time. But, you know, if you just if you just get into the playoffs, anything can happen. If you get into a groove and momentum can carry you a long way, then – you know, just about anything is possible in baseball. Would you rather be, it's my last one for you, would you rather be Chris Christie with a big plate of nachos or anyone else at the ballpark with no nachos? You can ask questions if you like. Well, I like nachos. They are practically a must every time I go to a baseball game. And my mm. dad gets them a lot. He likes peppers do, on his. Do you like, I was going to ask you, do you like the jalapeno peppers? Or do you think it uh, takes away from the, the cheese yeah. and the chip? I don't care for them personally. My dad likes them a lot. But, um, you know, I, I much rather have nachos at a ball game. I think I started liking nachos when I saw them in Angels in the Outfield years ago. And, you know, the guy ends up sitting on them on accident. I mean, that's not why... I liked him because he sat on them. They just—they looked good. appealing on his backside. They looked appealing, rubbed against his his blue jeans crease. He, the, the sitting oh. on the nachos, it's a fond memory. I, I get it. Uh, well, no, they were on his butt in on his uh, khaki pants mm. or whatever you want. But to call I want to I want to make sure the question is clear. If you choose to have this big plate of nachos, you must also be Chris Christie. Are you willing to be Chris Christie? For the rest of your your life, for this big plate of nachos or anyone else at the ballpark, but you don't have nachos. <laughs> As I would say, Chris Christie, because think about it, you're the governor of a state. You've got you know enough of a following right now that you know some people respect you, and you're pretty much set for your life financially. So you know, I, I think I'd like to be a big guy who can afford to you know let his waste loose a little bit more if, if I have more money than I, just about anybody else can make in I, I a year. I never got the, the look, the uh, the belt up by the nipples. Like, I believe a belt belongs below the belly. Chris Christie has somehow taken his suspenders above the stomach, and the belt is below his chest. It's like he's trying to hold in his ribcage. It, it blows my mind when I see his style choice, but I mean, it kind of works for him. He's kind of got that, uh, hey, hey, boss, hey, you know, that uh, rough and tough New Yorker. Maybe, that, maybe that's why he's done so well out east. I'm not sure. 
Wait, but you know something? Uh, Steve Urkel, he used to wear his pants way up. Steve's a very successful stomach. guy. Yeah, he's very successful. So you're going to go Chris Christie, Big Play, and Nachos. Okay, Mary Slap and Banish. I'm going to give you three players. Aaron okay. Judge, George Springer, Nolan Arenado. One of them you got to marry. they got to be on your team forever. The second one you got to slap. You're going to get them angry. They're going to come back, and they're going to beat you. And the third, you banish. You get them out of baseball. You can never have them. Nobody else can ever have them. Mary, slap, banish Aaron Judge, George Springer, Nolan Arenado, three players that will probably uh, all be up there for AL and NL MVPs. You know, Mary, I'd probably say George Springer because you know, mm. he's, a guy, he's a guy who doesn't really have a whole lot of baggage with him. He doesn't really surround himself with controversy. Not a whole lot of people pay attention to him. So, you know, I'd rather you know marry somebody who – that, you know, would probably just, you know, keep quiet a lot of the time. You know, I do my thing, he does his thing, and then uh, that's that. That's that. Um, slap, I would uh, probably Nolan Arenado because, you know, he seems like a guy who... You're not threatened. If you're going to slap him, you're not threatened. You're not thinking this guy's going to come back and and beat me with a, a massive home run in the bottom of the ninth inning. So you're going to pick Nolan Arenado to slap? Yes, um, just because I don't think he has the pure power that okay. Aaron Judge does, which leads me to my final point. Um, I'd probably banish Aaron Judge for the sole reason that I wouldn't have to see those stupid Judge wigs at Yankee Stadium or anywhere anymore. I mean, they're. I mean, I can see why they're doing it just because of his last name, but I don't generally like it when people take puns on names and. Wrote it for some stupid gag. I may get anti fun. I'm gonna flip. I'm gonna flip one answer there. I am going to marry Nolan Arenado because I know what I'm getting. He's a proven. I mean, the guy has led the National League in home runs two years in a row. People talk about Bryce Harper and, and Chris Bryant um, as being the two big hitters in the NL. The guy that might be the guy is in Colorado, and he plays third base, and it's Nolan Arenado, also a great defensive third baseman. If I'm going to build a franchise, I think Nolan might be the player outside of Mike Trout that I pick. Um, I'm going to I'm going to slap George Springer. Um, I, I don't see him as an effective player in the postseason. Um, he, he's a good regular season player. I'm not concerned when, they, when going gets tough, and I have to get him out in a big at bat. And then... I'm gonna agree with you. I can't take the 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 the, the, hat, the wigs are are preposterous. I mean, we're not in the Victorian area era, 1800s, 1900s, the 18th century. Yeah, or, what what are we uh, looking at here? I, I mean, judges don't even wear those. They could have a gavel if they'd like. It, it is a ridiculous little gimmick, and I am going to banish Aaron Judge. Okay, let's talk football. Okay. Um, Football is about to happen. We are about to have football on TV. Sunday is filled with football. And the hype around Thomas Brady to me is is a little bit too much. It, am, am I off? I mean, okay, 99 Brady on Madden. No way. I can at least think of three quarterbacks I'd rather have. Um, you're a Madden guy. You're a football guy. Mm -hmm. Is Brady getting too much love? Are the Patriots getting too much love? Well, I do think the Patriots are overloved for the simple fact that, you know, they are a Northeastern team, and, you know, that's where a lot of the media has, you know, placed its bias with the Yankees, Red Sox, and all that. I could go on and on about that, but I won't. But, you know, I think they get a little too much of a pass or what happened with Deflate Gate and what happened with Spy Gate and further back, and it seems you like you think they're not getting the punishment they deserve. You think no, pretty that, much, but yeah, they, yeah, I mean, they have gotten off scot free. They are they did the crime, but they're not doing the time. You're you're talking about the Patriots as a team that has has ripped off this NFL, uh, so to speak, and they're not being the ones that are are punished for it. It, it sounds like. Well, the irony is Brady did do the time. The, Patriots won the Super Bowl anyway, but with, with all that said, um, the Patriots, and particularly Tom Brady, has proven time and again that they are a force to be reckoned with, especially when they are at their worst possible moment in the biggest of games, and there's nothing that anybody can do to stop them. I mean, the Atlanta Falcons found out the hard way. I mean, it was just one bad play there. Uh, and their Super Bowl 
uh, appearance, and next thing you know, the Patriots have all the momentum. There's nothing the Falcons can do to stop it, and then we go to overtime. Patriots win. Um, it, you know, the Patriots are probably best equipped to deal with adversity more than any other team. I mean, if a suspension for Robert Goodell is not going to stop them, if finding them and taking away draft picks is not going to stop them, you know, I think as long as Brady is around and performing at a decent level and Belichick is still there to guide him, I don't see how anybody can compete with that. I'm not saying they're going to win the Super Bowl every year, but as long as those two guys are around, you have to put them in the conversation every single year as far as teams. That S- sum up the NFC in three short sentences. I'll give you an example. Um, here's mine. I like the Falcons. The Giants are my dark horse. The NFC West is better than people think. No, I think the Falcons are good. I think uh, you look at that offense, it's built to be good for a number of years. You've got a studly quarterback in Matt Ryan. The defense is only improving. They play great indoors. Uh, I think the Falcons are poised to be near the top of the NFC. Uh, Again, this year, the division's weak. I think that helps out. I like where the Falcons are at. The Giants are my dark horse. They They have Eli Manning on a kind of a... A prove-it year, a guy who's done everything, but he's kind of lost his legacy a bit. I think he's going to come out. He's going to come out gung-ho, and he's got a great receiving core, a defense that's improving. Uh, Landon Collins might be the best defensive back in the NFL. And then you have the NFC West, which I think is better than people think, and then the Cardinals are going to be good. Larry Fitzgerald motivated in his final year as a Cardinals receiver. Their defense is strong. I think Seattle's going to be much better than people think. Eddie Lacy was a good pickup. He fits in with Pete Carroll. And then I think the Rams are going to be better with uh, – Tim McVeigh and that offense as well. And then, of course, you have the 49ers who are not going to be good. But um, that is my way of summing up the NFC in three short sentences. I like the Falcons. The Giants are my dark horse. It's way and, more sentences. Well, three sentences. I like the Falcons. One, the okay. Giants are my dark horse. Two, and the NFC West is better than people think. Can you give me three from you? All right. Well, again, going back to the quarterbacks and – you know, let's, let's face it, it is a quarterback's league, so I think it all starts and ends with where the quarterbacks are going to be. Um, so I'm going to go with those, the teams that aren't so surprising. Uh, Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay, as long as he's there, they're going to be always be the favorites. Um, Dak Prescott is finally emerging as one of the top tier players in the game. He's already one of the top young players in the game, but you know I think he's due to ascend to even higher ground this year. And then Russell Wilson is still the man in Seattle, and you know the guy knows how to win, and I love quarterbacks that know how to win. So and he's got a Super Bowl ring to boot. So I think as long as he's there, then you have to put the of Seahawks in the conversation, at least as far as that. And then just to round it out, um, you know, I think the Panthers are due for a bounce back year. I mean, the Falcons, I feel like they had their shot. And, you know, the Panthers, they've had a year to, you know, just think about what went wrong in their Super Bowl appearance. And, you know, I think they'll be back this year. So I just, I guess my three senses uh, would be, you know, Go with the discount, double check. Oh. Go with the young guy who's taking the league by storm, and look for a team that's on its way back up. The discount, double check. Has that ever made you want to buy insurance? No. You haven't. Not, You've not bought after watching Rod to the discount, double check. Um. Well. I will say I have some good car insurance right now. Not with. State Farm. But. What is the – where does that compare to the other uh, dances in the NFL? The discount double check and you've got the the one where they spin the football and act like it's a fire. You've got the one where they, they point to the sky. Then they just high-five each other. What is the best celebration and is the discount double check in the top three? I, I don't know. I much prefer the – dunking with the goalpost because it's like so you take one sport and you the crossover it's it is an ode to a separate sport it's kind of like in a a tv show when like the simpsons and family guy partner together and they do one episode that's kind of what it's like when uh, an nfl player dunks a football in the goalpost You're like oh i wasn't expecting basketball today and you get basketball in football and it's it's an exciting moment for for everybody i think I'd like to see them do like a bunny hop when they score a touchdown. 
Are you you mean like the uh, the, the fingers chest high, uh, cl- cupped together like a bunny, and they jump on their tippy toes? No, the bunny hop goes like with your right foot. It's it's well, it's a uh, uh, back front, back front, and then same thing with left foot, back front, back. No, I'm sorry. It's left, right, left, right with the right foot, left, right, left, right with the left foot. One hop forward, one hop backward, and three hops forward. I don't know how you knew that, but that's impressive. I learned it way back when, and you know, uh, my fellow Austrians and I used it as our entrance for uh, one of my friend's weddings. So um, it, it was my idea. Uh, but we added uh, like one more thing at the end of it. It was like a, it was like a Superman wave. Oh, like like a like a Deb and Hester Superman Soldier Boy, uh, Superman that Ho, um, kind of lean to your left and right and go back and forth. I heard Soldier Boy just a few days ago, and I re- was recalling how I could not do that dance, no matter how much this one girl we knew in college tried to teach me. I, I just could not master way too much choreography. I know you. I know you've done some crazy bleep. Uh, maybe that's it. Maybe doing the Soldier Boy in college is it. I think the craziest thing that will happen this year is Rob Gronkowski gets injured doing a cannonball at a pool party in Foxborough in January because the water will be frozen. Why would he do that in January? I would, it, it, that's being an indoor pool, I would think, because he can't be stupid enough to He might. Jump. I think he is. He is, a, he is dumb enough to actually jump into a, a pool in Foxborough in January when people are outside and I think he'll break his his pelvis and it's going to be Brandon Cooks and Julian Edelman that will lead the Patriots deep into the playoffs. What do you think? What do you think the craziest thing uh, will happen this year? What will be the craziest thing that happens in the NFL? Craziest thing that will happen will be Andrew Luck will you know run scramble about so for some reason, it will scramble 30 yards back because an opposing defense, probably a team in the division, like like the Titans, they'll be blitzing him like crazy, and he, he'll just be too fast for them to catch up. He'll just like run 30 yards back. Then he'll throw a bomb. It, it's, it's like a last-ditch effort. And then it will be completed to some no-name receiver for – one of the biggest and most unlikely receptions in the history of the NFL. Jeff, I want to thank you so much for coming on uh, my podcast, Completely Serious, part of the Public House Media Network. First episode, this is probably going to go up on a Friday, possibly a Thursday, and you're likely listening to it over the weekend, maybe during your week. We're going to try to have a new episode up in about three or four days. Uh, The goal is to put these out on a Monday morning. So, Jeff, we're going to have you back on sometime. Um, All right, Greg, can I just say one more thing? Yes. Um, I, 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 going back to the uh, would you marry, slap, or banish. Oh, yeah, uh, about 20 minutes ago. Yeah, see, go back to that real quick. Uh, well, it's, it's more about the uh, marrying uh, fashion you know, between one man and another man. Have you seen this uh, animated short film that's gone viral on YouTube? It's called In a Heartbeat. I have not, no. Uh, does it involve a heart? And uh, um, maybe a beat, a heart beat, does it involve it those? Does. It actually does. It actually does involve a heart coming to life. It involves uh, you know, a boy who's uh, who's in the closet. Um, he is in the closet. Uh, he's hiding. Is he playing hide-and-seek? Is he in the closet for seven minutes in heaven? Um, something like that. He's, he's probably outside. He's just a fr- He's got his eye on somebody and, okay. and, and, and let's just say his heart is more into it than he is and he's not ready to reveal his true feelings just yeah but his heart won't take no for an answer so oh, yes. if you haven't seen it yet then I would check it out it's already got it, it, after two days over nine and a half million hits well I'll have to check that out <laughs> Jeff thanks a lot are you okay I thought her, her weird sound kind of come out of your mouth there was that me I can't quite tell it sometimes I don't know Thanks a lot, Jeffrey Jeffrey Clark, the copy editor and page designer for Shaw Media. I'm sorry. The one. There are several others. He's the the most talented. He will humbly tell you he's not. He is the most talented copy editor and page designer for Shaw Media uh, up in the suburbs of Chicago. Thank you so much. Completely Serious with Ryan Appears is out. We'll be back in a couple of days, maybe with Jeff, maybe with a different guest. You never know. 
on Public House Media.